last night's event was awesome. Absolutely awesome and absolutely inspiring to see so many students and so many people that care about them all out there. And to see this again now this morning, to see so many people who care so deeply about the community has just been a double dose of inspiration in coming down here. To all the folks that, that, you know, that have helped you know, make this happen, uh, you know, to, to, to Chuck, to, to Jen, to, to Anthony, to Michael, to all these different people that I've met who are doing such amazing work, and to all of you, thank you. Thank you for knowing that the only way that we can further our communities is if everyone is involved in that. The beauty of the students that were up here, the beauty of, 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 of you know, my friend Dale and folks from the Wounded Warrior Project and all these people that care about public service, the beauty is that working with them and investing in them is not a charity. It's an investment. Working with young people who are going to be part of this larger conversation. Working with veterans who know that service doesn't simply stop once you take off the uniform. It's not a charity. It's an investment. And folks from the business community, folks from the nonprofit sector, we all understand the only way we're going to advance this conversation is if we're all part of the conversation. You don't need to have your name on a, on a, on a billboard or a ballot in order to make change, in order to make a difference. That's not the way the system functions, it's not the way it works. The only way we can advance the conversation is if we all feel a vested interest in having that conversation. And I remember it actually, it, it reminds me of, I had a conversation with, with my publisher before, you know, I, uh, about the, the book that I wrote, The Other Westmore, and we were having a conversation about titles. And I know, you know, Jen's a published author, and, and quite a few folks in here are published authors, so you all know what I'm talking about. When you become published and you're going through the process of publishing, one thing I realized, and I didn't realize then, but I realize now, is that everything you see on the inside of a book all the words, all the structuring, all that kind of stuff, that's the author's intent. That's what the author wants to share. That's what the author wants to give out. That's what the author wants the world to read and understand. Everything you'll see on the outside of a book, the cover, the title, the author photos, the quotes and all that kind of stuff, that's the publisher. And there's a reason for it is that the publisher knows that when you walk into a bookstore, you've got 3.2 seconds or whatever the mathematical equation they pull together. Uh, Matt, maybe you can help me out with the, with the mathematical equations and, and the, in the business sense. By the way, I'm extremely proud of you, and I'm, you know, it's wonderful you've been, uh, you know, you've continued to do amazing things. We got some great schools up in Maryland, man, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we'd love to have you take a look up there, too. So, uh, sorry, I didn't come down to poach, I apologize. Um, but everything you see on the outside of the book, that's publisher, because they know when you walk into a bookstore, you know, you've got 3.2 seconds in order to capture someone's attention before they keep on walking and they move on to the next books, right? So when they have conversations with authors, I didn't know this at the time, and when they ask them their opinions on covers and titles, it's really more ceremonial than anything else. I thought they cared, right? So they call me in, and we're having this conversation about what the title and what the cover should be and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, so Wes, what do you think that the title of the book should be? And I was like, I'm glad y'all asked, because I have a whole bunch of good ideas. And they're like, well, what are they? And I said, well, what about Baltimore Suns? Or what about All the Difference? Or what about Out of Many? And I threw out like half a dozen names that I really liked. And I looked at them, and I smiled. And I was like, so what do you guys think? And they looked back, and they're like, those are pretty good. They said, but we think we have a better idea for you. What do you think about the other Westmore? And I looked at him and I said, that might be the dumbest book title that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's true. And they said, well, what don't you like about it? I said, actually, there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't like about it, but let me go ahead and start with three, all right? <laughs> First thing I don't like about it is that I wanted to be clear that this book is about much more than just these two kids. I wanted people to understand it's about much more than just two kids. It's about much more than just one name. It's about much more than one, demo, one socioeconomic group, than one neighborhood, than one race, than one generation. It's about all of us. It's about the decisions that we make in our lives and the people we have in our lives who help us to make those decisions. So by putting the name inside of the book, are you not completely negating that entire intent? Second thing I told them I don't like about it, you know, what self-respecting author do you know that puts their own name 
inside of a book title. Third thing I told him I didn't like about it. No one knows who one Wes Moore is. So why does anybody care who the other <laughs> Wes Moore is? Right? And so they looked at me, and they smiled, and they said, you know, those are all really good points. They said, the problem, though, is that you're missing the point. The problem is that you're missing the point. You're absolutely right. This book is not about you, and it's not about him. The name is irrelevant because you could throw any name inside of that book title because there are Westmores that exist in each and every one of our communities, in each and every one of our schools, each and every one of our churches, each and every one of our communities. Kids who are literally one decision away from going in one direction or going in a completely different direction. Kids who have all the potential in the world, and in many cases, they don't even know it. The name is irrelevant. The most important thing about the title is the other. The fact that our society is full of others. People who might not look like us, people who might not speak like us, people who maybe come from a different part of town, but whose long-term destiny matters as much to our community as ours does, whose purpose and whose opportunity to make a contribution to our community matters just as much as ours does. Because one thing I think we all understand, particularly, you know, especially folks in the business community, is that the best way for you to thrive and the best way you, for you to have a strong, sustainable business community is if you can have a community that supports each other. If you can have a community that will can spend time and invest on the actual creation of quality citizens instead of investing later on on the separation of citizens. That's how we have this conversation, the others. And it was interesting because it took a while for me to really have a better understanding and a better appreciation of what exactly that meant. The, um, you know, my story and my background uh, starts off how, uh, and how really the, the book begins is talks about this article that the Baltimore Sun did. And the Baltimore Sun wrote this piece and wrote this article about myself and about a local kid who had just received the Rhodes Scholarship. And how I was going to be one of these 32 Americans that was going to head overseas on this, on this full scholarship. And in this article, they talked a little bit about the scholarship, but they also talked a little bit about my background. They talked about the fact that I only have two memories of my father. And the second memory that I have of my father was when I was three and a half years old, was when I watched him die. They talked about the fact that, you know, as tough as I thought I had it, after my father passed away, the person who had it toughest wasn't myself, wasn't my older sister, my younger sister, but it was actually my mother, who was now in her 20s and a widow with three children that she was going to raise on her own. And when we moved up from Baltimore, we moved up from Maryland, she, told, she called up her parents, my grandparents, and said that I need help. I can't do this on my own. So my grandparents, my, grandmother, my grandfather is a, uh, was a minister. My grandmother was a public school teacher in the South Bronx for 27 years. And they gave her the answer that she was hoping they would give, which is bring the kids up here, and we can help out. But almost immediately as I moved up, I found myself getting very lost. I found myself trying to find this definition of manhood from a whole bunch of people who had no business teaching me anything. I found myself trying to connect and try to gain acceptance from a bunch of friends, from a bunch of people who tell me to go do X, Y, and Z, and then I would go and do it, and I would get in trouble, and I'd turn around, and my friends are nowhere to be found. And by the time I was eight and nine years old, I started picking and choosing which days were worthwhile to go to school. By the time I was nine and 10 years old, I was already on academic and disciplinary probation. By the time I was 11 years old was the first time that I felt handcuffs on my wrists. And my mother decided that things needed to change. You know, my mother has always been very creative with her punishments. Um, but she realized that none of them were working, that the more she would push, the more I would pull. And so what ended up happening was by the time I was probably around eight or nine years old, my mother started threatening me with this idea of military school. 
she'd come to my room, she'd look at my report card, she said, you gotta be kidding me. She said, you don't get this together, I'm gonna send you to military school. And I looked at her and I was like, mommy, I'm gonna work harder, I'll do better. And then when I was 10 years old, the threats kept coming, she started giving me brochures to show me she wasn't playing around. I'd look at the brochures and I'd say, okay, mommy, I can see you're serious, I can see you're mad, I'll work harder. You know, 11, 12 years old came, threats kept coming, I kept on blowing them off. And finally when I was 13 years old, she came into my room and she's like, you know what? I'm gonna send you to military school. And I looked at her and I was like, mommy, I can see you're mad and I'm gonna work harder. And she's like, nah, you're going next week. And <laughs> she, uh, she had me start packing my stuff up to go to military school. And, and, and the, tr the truth is, quite honestly, is that I really did think, even after we loaded this stuff up into the car, I thought we would just drive around the block <laughs> a few times because there was no way she was actually gonna send me away. The problem was that she kept driving and she drove all the way to Pennsylvania and she drove to uh, this, this uh, military academy in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And this school was in the middle of nowhere. And uh, understand, up until this point in my life, I don't know anything about the woods, right? <laughs> I know Baltimore, I know the Bronx, I know cities, I know big buildings, I know lights, I know barking dogs, I don't know the trees, I don't know the woods. And this school was like if you take the forest and you just do a big cutout and pour concrete in the middle and shape it into some buildings and call it a school. This is, this is, this is where we're at. And, uh, and when I first arrived there, I let anyone know who would listen to me that I'm not staying. You can say whatever you want to say to me. I'm not going to be here long. I couldn't stand the fact that they were, would constantly yell. And I'm like, I'm right here. I hear you perfectly fine. There's no point in yelling. <laughs> I didn't understand. I don't understand why, you know, we had to wake up before the sun even found it rational to wake up. I don't understand any of this stuff, right? And so literally what they would do was well, there were these big black gates that surrounded the school. And they would always tell us, they're like, listen, if you guys don't like it here, there's a train station right in Wayne. Have fun. You know, go on home. And so I took them up on that offer. So every time they would turn their backs, I would then proceed to run out of the gates and run out through the woods to try to find this train station in Wayne. After the fourth time I tried to run, I ran away four times in the first four days, right? After the fourth time I ran away, I was sitting inside my room because they'd go and they'd bring you back to campus. I was sitting inside my room with my roommate and my squad leader walks into the room and we called the room to attention, room attention, huh, standing attention. And my squad leader says to my roommate, he says, get out, I gotta talk to more. And so my roommate grabs his stuff and he runs out of the room and I'm staying at attention and I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. <laughs> Cause whatever's about to go down, he doesn't want witnesses. So I'm just standing there at attention <laughs> and I'm just waiting. And then he tells me to sit down. So I grab my chair and I sit down and he grabs my roommate's chair and he sits down next to me. And he says, listen, more. it's obvious you don't wanna be here. And quite honestly, we really don't want you here. So I've actually drawn you a map on how to get to the train station. <laughs> so my man, Sergeant Austin reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a map and he hands me this map. And this map has like, you know, handwritten directions. It's got pace counts. It's got landmarks, it's got, it's got, you know, a legend on the bottom. I mean, this thing is beautiful. And I'm looking at this thing like he just handed me a lottery ticket, right? And literally there are tears welling up in my eyes and I'm looking at him I'm like, listen, I'll never forget you. When you, <laughs> when you get out, let me know, we'll grab lunch. I mean, I am so excited at this point because all I needed to get out of here was really this map, right? And so he just looks at me, he's just like, just get out of here. So that night I planned this whole big great escape where I knew that TAPS, which is Lights Out, was at 10 p.m. every night and Reveille, which is our wake up call, which was always accompanied by, you know, Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses and banging trash cans, was at 5.30. So I knew, okay, I'm gonna set my alarm for 11.30 because that'll, they'll, they should be asleep by then, but it'll still give me a good six hour head start before anyone realizes that I'm gone. My alarm goes off, I quickly shut it off, I say goodbye to my roommate, and I had like a bag that had a change of clothes and a granola bar and a flashlight <laughs> in my map, and I was ready to go. So I took it and I ran out of the gates and I started running through the woods. And as I'm running through the woods, I have this map and the map says, okay, you're gonna go 20 paces and you'll see a big tree and make a left. 
right? So I go, you know, 15, 16, 17, I go 20 paces, I see a big tree, and I make a left. The problem is that I'm in the middle of the woods. Ain't number of big trees all around me, <laughs> right? Then it says you're gonna go 30 paces, you'll see a big rock, and you'll make a right. I go 30 paces, I see a rock, I make a right. I'm passing dozens of big rocks along the way. It is pitch dark outside, and I'm terrified. Because the only thing I know about the forest, and the only thing I know about the woods, is that in horror movies, this is where folks go and don't come out of. <laughs> so, um, so eventually, after what seemed like a couple hours, probably more like 15 minutes, I, I sit down and I just start crying. I have no idea where I am, and I'm terrified. And I'm not just scared, I'm angry. I'm angry because I feel like nobody's listening to me. I'm angry because people are telling me, oh, you need to do this, you need to work hard, you need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't care. Just let me go home. And as I'm sitting there crying, I start hearing leaves rustling. And I thought it was just like, you know, wild animals chasing me or whatever <laughs> in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And, um, <laughs> and then I start hearing laughter. So I turn around and look, and it's my entire chain of command who'd follow me out because the map was fake. The map took me to the middle of the woods. They just, A, wanted to get a laugh, and B, wanted to see how bad I wanted to go home. And that night, they got both. And so they're bringing me back to campus. And as we're walking back to campus, I just remember thinking to myself how much I can't stand each and every one of them. Right? I'm thinking about how much I do not like this place. I'm thinking, uh, and quite honestly, I'm thinking how much I don't like my mom at this point either for thinking this is a good idea. But as my mom told us when we were coming up, she always said, you know, I never gave birth to you because I needed another friend. So friendship wasn't something she was looking for either. Uh, so she was cool with that. I'm glad y'all find that funny. I didn't find it very funny. <laughs> so they bring us back to campus and we're in the middle of something called plebe system. So there's no outside communication, no telephones, no radios, uh, you know, no, no televisions, nothing. It's your chance, You're, you will either succeed as a team or you will fail as a team, your choice. But they said, we're gonna make an exception because if we don't, we're gonna lose them. So they said, more, you've got five minutes. Call whoever you want, five minutes. And I call the only, only number that I know, which is mom. So I call mom and mom won't expect to hear from me for about eight weeks and now here it is on day four, one o'clock in the morning. Mom gets a phone call, so she's freaking out. I'm like, mommy, it's okay. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, uh, but I'm really ready to come home. Uh, if, if you let me come home, I'll go to school more often. I'll clean my room, I'll clean your room, I'll do whatever you want me to do, just let me come home. And I start going through this whole diatribe of what she needs to do to make my life easier. And she stops me. And she says, too many people have sacrificed in order for you to be there. And too many people are rooting for you. And you've got to understand it's not all about you. It's not all about you. And I listened to her talk for her five minutes, and then they said the time is up. I gave them back the phone, they hung up the phone, they sent me back up to my room. And I'd be lying if I said anything changed that night, because it didn't. You know, I went to bed that night just as angry as I went to bed the night before. I woke up the next morning even angrier, because I knew I wasn't getting out of this place. But eventually I began to understand what she was talking about. Eventually, I began to understand that the only way that I was going to make it was if my friends and my plea brothers were there to push me. And the only way that they were going to make it was if I was there to push them. If that is not about the success of the individual, it's about the success of the team. And that we all had a role to play in order to make sure that team succeeds. By the end of that first year, I was actually doing okay academically, and I was allowed to play sports because I wasn't on probation anymore. And, you know, they gave me some ranks, and I was in charge of people, so I was excited. And, uh, and for the first time, when people asked my mom, how's Wes doing, she could say he's doing okay and not be lying. And that actually meant something. So by the end of that first year, we'd moved back down to Maryland. And my mother said I had a chance to go back to school in Baltimore if I wanted to. And I said, actually, if it's okay, I'd like to sit tight. I ended up actually finishing high school there, joining the Army right out of high school, going on to junior college. And after junior college, going on to Johns Hopkins University, 
And it was while I was at Johns Hopkins that the Baltimore Sun wrote this article about a local kid who had just received the Rhodes Scholarship. But at the same time, the Baltimore Sun was writing a whole series of articles on four guys who one day walked into a jewelry store. The first two guys walked in the jewelry store, and when they walked into the store, they reached in their coats and they pulled out guns. They cocked the guns back, and they started pointing the guns at everybody inside the store, telling everybody to get on the ground and keep your hands on top of your heads. And everybody who was inside the store, either working or shopping, got on the ground and put their hands on the top of their heads like they were told to do. And then about 10 seconds later, two other guys walked in the jewelry store. And when they walked in the store, they reached in their coats and they pulled out mallets. One guy with a gun and one guy with a mallet went to the left. One guy with a gun and one guy with a mallet went to the right. The ones with the guns were keeping everybody on the ground while the ones with the mallets were walking around and just smashing out jewelry cases and taking out watches and rings and necklaces. Then all four guys met in the back of the store and one of them yelled, let's go. And then all four then ran out of the center of the store and ran outside to the adjacent parking lot. One of the people that was inside the store that day was an off-duty police officer. He was a 13-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Force. He was a three-time recipient of Police Officer of the Year. He was a father of five who just had triplets. The reason he was working that day was because it was his day off from the police force and he took on a second job to make extra money for his family. When the guys left the store, he got up off the ground and he drew his weapon and he ran outside to see if he could stop them from getting away. And when he ran outside, he started kneeling next to cars and kneeling next to vehicles to give himself cover. He didn't realize when he went outside and started kneeling next to the vehicles that one of the vehicles that he was kneeling next to was one of the vehicles that the guys were in. And then a window rolled down and then three shots were taken at point blank range. And the officer was killed instantly. There was a 12 day national manhunt for these four guys and finally after 12 days all four guys were caught. One of the people that the police were looking for, one of the people that was eventually captured and tried and convicted and sentenced for the crime was a guy whose name was also Wes Moore. And the more I learned about this crime and the more I learned about this tragedy and the more I learned about the people who were responsible for it, the more I learned that Wes and I had in common than just our names. I learned that we were living in the same neighborhood literally blocks away from each other. I learned that we both grew up in single parent households, we both had academic and disciplinary troubles growing up, that we both were around the same age. And so I started thinking to myself, so how does this happen? How do you get two kids from similar backgrounds and similar circumstances who end up going in two completely different directions? That as I'm getting ready to head 3,000 miles away from home on a scholarship, he's getting ready to head 25 miles away from home to a maximum security facility for the rest of his life. Him, his older brother, and two other people who were there that day. And I knew there were questions I wanted to ask, and he was the only one that could answer them. So one day, I just decided to write him a note. I had no idea if he'd write back. But I wrote him this note, literally it's, it was, hey Wes, my name is Wes, here's how I heard about you, and I listed a whole series of questions. And then a month later, I get a letter back from Jessup Correctional Institution, from Westmore. And it'd be one thing if the letter I would have gotten from Wes, if it was like it was written in crayon, or he wrote it with his whole hand, and it didn't make any sense, I would have looked at that letter and tried to read it and said to myself, you know what, I get it. This actually makes sense. The problem is that I've never received that letter from Wes. The problem is the letter that I did receive from Wes was one of the most interesting and articulate letters that I've ever received. And it only led to more questions. And that one letter turned into dozens of letters, those dozens of letters turned into dozens of visits, and now I've known Wes for over eight years. 
And what's interesting is that, you know, one thing I try to be very clear about, and I'd known Wes for years before the idea of a, of, a, of a book even came about, but one thing I try to be clear about was that this book is not about cast and revisionist history. It's not about reopening cases. It's not about appeal processes. It's about none of that. Wes's fate is sealed. The question that I wanted to ask was why was his fate sealed so long before February 7th of 2000, just a little over 12 years ago? And what can we learn from it? And people sometimes say, they're like, so what was the difference? What was the one thing that if we can give kids this, then they'll be just fine? And I say, you know, the, the challenge is there is no one thing. There is no single thing that we can say if a child has this, they'll be fine. Or if they don't have that, they won't be fine. Raising kids is amazingly complicated. And when you happen to raise kids in some of the most precarious communities of our country, it's that much more complicated. But there are a couple things that I know that fundamentally matter. One is that education matters. And it matters past the boys. Take it away from the boys for a second, that the fact that this is a story about one guy who goes off to finish college, et cetera, and then one who doesn't go past 10th grade. Take it back a generation to the parents. Wes's mother was the first one in her family to go to college. She graduated from Baltimore City Community College with honors and then gets accepted at Johns Hopkins University. She's at Johns Hopkins University when one day she receives a letter indicating that her grants were cut and she knew that she could no longer afford to go to school. I can't help but think how different her life could have been had she had the chance to finish school. And it's not just because of the piece of paper, it's not because of the thing you get to frame and throw up on a wall or you get to change the first line of your resume, but because as you move up in education, your networks will change. Your friendships will change. Your connections will change. I know I'll be the first, and we asked every donor, I'll be the first one to raise my hand if for people, either the job you have now or a job you had in recent history, if you did not get that job through monster.com or through the classified ads. Because 70% of jobs in this country don't happen that way. 70% of jobs in this country happen because one day you get a phone call or an email from somebody who says we have a mutual friend and I'm looking for someone that can do X, Y, and Z and they recommended that I talk to you. 70% of jobs in this country happen because one day you call up a friend or a mentor or a teacher or a professor and you say, I'm really interested in getting into this field. Do you know anybody that does it? And that person says, I know three people that do that. I'll put you guys in touch. That's how this game works. Education matters not just because of what you're learning, but it also matters because who you're learning it from and who you're learning it with. Another thing that I know that fundamentally matters are expectations matter. I remember once when I was speaking with Wes about Baltimore, and I asked him, I said, so do you think that we're products of our environment? And Wes looked back at me and he said, actually, I think we're products of our expectations. And I thought to myself, he's absolutely right. We're not products of our environments, we're products of our expectations. Why that matters though is this. Expectations aren't born from nowhere. The expectations that people have of themselves, in many cases, are the expectations that other people have of them. And people then will work very hard to either live up to those expectations or live down to them. Someone once said, they're like, it's a real shame you lived up to your expectations, and Wes didn't. And I said, actually, the real shame is that we both did. That's the real shame. We are a nation of self-fulfilling prophecies. How we think about ourselves and how we think about others, making sure that everybody feels a vested interest in this larger experiment, it matters because that will then help to forge the type of communities that we live in. And another thing, the last thing that I know that fundamentally matters is we all matter. How we decide to spend our time and how we decide to serve matters. One thing I was saying last night is that, you know, I, I, I don't wanna stand here and, and try to tell you what to think. I just wanna ask you to think. Think about what everybody can do in their own individual space 
to make a difference. If your thing is, if you want to work with, with veterans, then drive on and work with veterans. If you want to work on the environment, great. If you want to work with animals, fantastic. If you want to work with seniors, excellent. If you want to work with young people, let's do it. But do something. Be a part of something bigger than just yourselves. Because that's what true legacy really is. I remember when I had a, uh, I had a colonel in military school. And this dude was as tough as nails. He was a three-time Vietnam veteran. And uh, my plea brothers and I used to say, uh, you know, I think we saw him smile once. And I think it was an accident when we saw him smile. <laughs> eh, it was like a nervous twitch or something. We're like, oh, my, did he smile? No, I'm sorry. Um, but he was fair. And we loved him for it. But he was losing weight really quickly. And he called the entire Corps of Cadets together. And he told us that he, is, that he was diagnosed with cancer and he had to leave the school. But he said something to us that day that I will never forget. He said, when it's time for you to leave here, whether it's time for you to leave this school, when it's time for you to leave your community, when it's time for you to leave your job, or when it's time for you to leave this planet, make sure that it mattered that you were ever here. Make sure that it mattered that you were ever here. That's fundamentally all we're ever asked to do. None of us are promised anything. More days, more years. No, one has, no one's ever tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Wes, you know, you've got 4,622 more days left, so you can go ahead and pace yourself. Right? And no one ever will. The only thing we're ever asked to do is make sure that it mattered that we were ever here. And the best way of doing that is making sure that we're leaving a legacy for others. If we can do that, then we've done our jobs. If we can do that, then that's all we've ever been asked to do. I'm thankful not just for your service, but I'm thankful for your commitment to others. One of the beautiful things I was talking with, with Chuck yesterday about this, you know, this isn't, you know, these aren't about just get-togethers and exchanging business cards. This is about how do we change a community? How do we become some part of something bigger than just ourselves? That's inspiring. That's motivating. And that will accomplish its mission. So I'm humbled to be here. I'm thankful for your time. And I'm honored to help and work in any way with you that I can. God bless you all. And thank you.